Hi, my name is Roy Guestford. I'm from San Diego, California, and this is my first trip, my fifth, first visit to the Shenandoah Country Club where the Chaldean Museum is. I used to work at Pebble Beach Golf Course, and I think that although that's a great and world famous course, this museum on Chaldeans is even more exciting and more beautiful. One of the things that I do in San Diego is I'm a publisher, and we've been focusing on the Chaldean Aramaic language for about seven years now. And we have several books. One of them is the children's book called Read and Write Aramaic by Father Michael Bezzi. Another one is Classical Aramaic by Michael Bezzi and Dr. Rocco Errico. And the third is my master's thesis called Preserving the Chaldean Aramaic Language. And this ziggurat is one that's in the museum. This was a stamp from Hungary in 1980. And we blew this postage stamp up, put it on the cover. These images are very difficult to come by, but the mathematics that was used to build the ziggurat was done 2000 years before the Pythagorean theorem was built. So the Chaldeans were advanced in many, many different ways. One of them certainly was math and science, religion, spirituality, the building of cities. My study at urban, as an urban studies and planning major at UC San Diego showed me that the early cities were imperative for humanity's growth. And so we're so grateful to the Chaldeans for all they've done. So let's take an adventure in and see where it all began. Here's a picture of similar imagery without the language of the Chaldeans here. This is the, called a ziggurat, the tower that heads up like this. And they had foliage and um, the hanging gardens, according to Amer Hana Fatui, were the, um, uh, a gift from Nebuchadnezzar to his wife, who was from the Northern Territory. And she was lonely and she missed her homeland and she was homesick. So it was a love story that brought the hanging gardens. And, um, and so he, he built the gardens for his wife so she would feel comfortable in, um, in Babylon. So I love that, that aspect. To me, love permeates so much of the Chaldean teaching, so much of the Chaldean language, the language of Abraham, the language of Jesus, the language of his disciples. Um, so shlam lechon, which means peace to everyone, and shlam lechen, especially to all the Chaldean women out there. Uh, it's a wonderful, wonderful language, and um, the history of it is found right here in this museum in Detroit, Michigan. West Bloomfield is beautiful. We have um, artifacts that actually I think were created recently and date back from native Chaldeans and have the whole culture all the way, um, uh, the, the culture of Ur, which Abraham came out of, the early Sumerians. Uh, would have been where the Chaldean culture came out of, but the golden helmet of Ur and the golden dagger of Ur uh, testify that Ur was a real place and that the Chaldeans um, really did come from um, uh, the kingdom of Hammurabi, would have been the original. Um, and, and the language, I think, would have been some combination of Sumerian and Akkadian. So I'm learning those languages now. It was difficult enough for me to learn the Aramaic language. Uh, I started off with Hebrew. I studied Hebrew with a female rabbi for 15 years. And then I went to the Graduate Theological Union in Berkeley, where I learned formally at seminary the Hebrew language. So shalom to all the Hebrew speakers out there. Shalom, shlama, and salam. The three, um, uh, uh, they're called um, Shemitic, Semitic languages, the three Semitic languages, Akkadian and also um, uh, out of Ethiopia, Ethiopic is the fifth uh, Semitic language. So as we head here, the jewelry, the arts, the music, everything has to do with um, the origin of cities. And since we were no longer hunters and gatherers, uh, what could we do with our free time? Well, we could contribute to humanity and make it a better place. And that's what the Chaldean story to me really is all about, is how we have amenities in society today. I have a cell phone, I just got one of these. I always had a flip phone, now we have cell phones and 
We have time to talk on the phone and do wonderful things. Why aren't we studying the Chaldean language all the time? So uh, with our free time, the gift that humanity has given us, we should be using it in a productive way with every free minute. You can watch TV, you can go on the internet, or you can open the children's book and teach your children Chaldean Aramaic, the alphabet, the letters, the Estrangela letters were the Estrangela letters that are on the, um, the front of this museum. And they are what separate Chaldean Aramaic from all the other Aramaics. There are over 150 Aramaic dialects. Uh, if you want to see uh, the, the advanced stages, you can look at Jeffrey Kahn at Cambridge University and Google how they're breaking it down. But even Jeffrey Kahn is not familiar with the Estrangela like the Chaldean people are. So uh, there's a very unique dialect dealing with the Chaldean Aramaic. Um, uh, of course, we have Babylon, the Lion of Chaldea, which we saw out in front on the cover. My favorite thing in here, I've always wondered what Amina was. I read about it in the Bible, and the stone Mina weight, I think, is just wonderful. That's what Amina looked like. So when it talks about the weight and, and a just balance in Proverbs, they're talking about this. And, of course, the clay tablets with the creation of the world this is some of the first writing done in humanity. It's so important um, because today we take advantage. We, we just punch a few buttons on a computer and we print out books. Historically, the reason that Aramaic was left to write, well, is because they had an anvil and you, you hit it on the bottom and you had to carve the letters on the wall. And that was why it reads left to right is because they would hit with this hand and they would go in this direction. So we're so grateful that the language has been preserved, the original, the earliest language by humanity. It's the oldest spoken language by humanity today. Uh, the second one, and there's some competition, friendly competition, is Tamil, which is spoken in India. So uh, Sanskrit is probably a, maybe older than Chaldean, but no one speaks Sanskrit. Tamil is the closest. And so the, the native Chaldean Aramaic speakers, the oldest spoken language today. So we're so grateful that it's being preserved. Uh, Father Bazi has, t teaches both the modern classical Aramaic and the ancient. And the ancient is probably dates to about 200 AD. So it's probably not exactly at the time of Jesus, but it's very close. And it's the closest one that we know. Actually, his co-author is Dr. Rocco Errico, and Dr. Errico spent 30 years looking for the dialect closest to Jesus. And I called him after my Aramaic, after my Hebrew class in Berkeley, and I said, Dr. Errico, please save me 30 years of experience. Which dialect should I study? And he said, move to San Diego, and you can learn the dialect closest spoken by Jesus because of the Babylonian captivity. It would have been Babylonian Aramaic. So I moved from one side of California all the way down to the other, I've taken five courses, well, four courses from Father Michael in the last eight years, and it's changed my life. I'm so grateful to have some understanding of ancient literature. It's the most exciting thing to do is to be inspired by a book. And I'm from Hollywood, and the movie stars are interesting too, but the literature of the Chaldean is the most interesting. Okay, so this is the blue. The Nebuchadnezzar, I really am from Hollywood. The family, that's, this is, uh, mm, Hmm. I don't have much positive to say about Hollywood, so I'm not going to say anything more. But the, um, the, the, <laughs> the blue uh, is famous for uh, Babylon and the Chaldean gates. Um, the Ishtar gate, the cover that we have here, this photo actually is from Babylon. This was taken by a Chaldean woman who was working for... Uh, the um, State Department and in her off time she would go and take photos so she stayed in Saddam Hussein's palace after he was overthrown and then uh, and she was a family she had four children at the time she gave up everything to go sacrifice for her new country and to teach uh, the culture to the people here and she snapped the photographs dear Bernadette I'm so grateful for her and um, the the actual blue is at the Berlin Museum. So the Gate of Ishtar is in Berlin, I believe. I haven't been there, but now I get to go to Berlin sometime as well. So I think it looked about like this. This replica is in Berlin. Um, but the, the 
the original is in Berlin, and the replica, which this photograph is, is actually from Babylon. So now we head into the sacred, not secret, but sacred aspects of Aramaic because it all, uh, here we have the disciples, the, the truth, the, the fact that um, probably Thomas and Maradi, what language did they speak? Greek? Even my Greek professor didn't know that Aramaic is still spoken. They probably spoke Aramaic. God bless our Western Christian people and all our theologians, and I love them, and I'm so grateful for them, but we need to learn very gently. He probably spoke Aramaic, and the language and the New Testament are still written in Aramaic, so even Americans can study Chaldean Aramaic, and Greek, and Hebrew, and Latin, and Spanish, and French. Everyone can learn six or seven languages. Why not? It's fun. But save some says my students now, uh, for Let in the Light Publishing, we offer tutoring. And they say, well, what language should we learn? We can learn Hebrew or Greek or Aramaic. And I say, well, the oldest of the three is Aramaic. So your choice, would you like to learn Hebrew, Aramaic, or Greek? Hmm, we can leave the oldest, simplest language that Jesus spoke first or another one. Let's start with Aramaic. <laughs> That's my easy sales pitch to say, it's a beautiful language and should be honored, honored. And we're so grateful that this museum exists. This is wonderful. Okay. So let's see, what more do I know? The map here, this is very interesting because this, the Holy Land is here. And in America, we have the idea that Christianity went in one direction through Peter in Greek <laughs> and somehow ended up in America. But the truth is, it went this direction through many other disciples, including Thomas, and ended up in Persia and China. And by the year 1000 AD, there were 10,000 churches that were Christian and Aramaic speaking in China and India. And today in Beijing, at a library there, there is a stella dated about 500 AD in Aramaic. Uh, I have a photo of that and can share that with you. But the, the language went in two directions. In America, we think everything is Greek or English, but technically we have a lot to, to learn here. So um, the original scrolls would have looked like this closer. Uh, this is, uh, there, um, during, the Hebrew people would have studied Babylonian Aramaic or Jewish Aramaic. So the, the Jewish people have a very strong um, desire to preserve Chaldean Aramaic because their Talmud, their teachings uh, outside of the Bible, were written in Chaldean Aramaic. And so... Uh, many of them, and, and actually many of the Dead Sea Scrolls that are in Aramaic are currently in Israel, and thank heavens, because they're doing a wonderful job of preserving them there. It's one of the few places in the world where it is, is such a sacred language. Um, and of course, Aramaic, if Abraham spoke Aramaic, then later on, Hebrew came out of Aramaic. It's the older language, and then Arabic would have come a little bit later. So um, this has the ancient language of modern Chaldeans and just for friendly way Father Michael also teaches modern Aramaic. The dialect it's very controversial is closest to what is spoken in Telkepe or was spoken in Telkepe. There are many different dialects we respect all the dialects but Father Michael as a village in Telkepe is his home this is the dialect that's closest to his heart which he teaches. So um, many of the different dialects are written here um, and we're very grateful for them, the ancient and the modern. Uh, and at Let in the Light, we offer tutoring in ancient and modern Aramaic. And the, the teachers in the course, including myself, are graduates of the Cuyamaca College um, course that Father Michael teaches in Rancho San Diego. So we have actual students of Father Michael teaching classical and modern Aramaic. So much fun, oh, it's wonderful. This is a beautiful, oh my gosh. So, yeah, we can read some of this, um, but <laughs> the pronunciation, fortunately, just so you're aware of it, the dots around the letters are typically speaking the vowels. And so there's consonants and vowels. The vowels were not added until later, but in both Hebrew, Greek, and Aramaic, there, the vowels become important to preserve the proper pronunciation. 
And so um, uh, the Aramaic has the vowels added to it. And with that, uh, we can um, make sure that the oh, uh, general public here in the United States and other areas can have the correct uh, pronunciation of how to speak Aramaic. And there are different dialects, so it will never be uniform, but some idea is helpful. And this is evidence that it's been around for a long time. Our final room, <laughs> the village of Tilkepe. Now, Father Michael's new book is called A Day in the Life of the Tilkepnaye. And his original master's thesis in 1967 was called Tilkepe, Past and Present. And so you have village workers, a cross on the door, you have the church, the beloved symbol that is now back even after ISIS came through it, in 2020, I believe, they have now reestablished the church, thanks to the bishop there. And I don't know if life will ever return to normal how it was before, but we have the women and the men. And so in Father Michael's history of the day of the life of Tilkep Naye, his new book, he goes on to say that Every day, every month, was a day dedicated to God, a dedicated toward worship, and that through the, the living of the Tilkep Naye, they expressed their gratitude and love for God and humanity. And I feel that this is what the Chaldean community here in Detroit has done. We're so grateful for all that they have established, and it may continue, the museum continues here. I encourage you to come view it yourself sometime. But for now, our history, our, our little promotion of, of Let in the Light Publishing, Father Michael, the Chaldean community in San Diego, which spreads its love to those here in Detroit, will probably stop here. So thank you so much, and I'm so grateful to be able to share a little time with you.